following on from lift problems, we're going to start thinking about connected particles. So in a lift, we always had the lift and at least one object in it, and we could either look at just the thing in the lift, or we could look at the lift as a whole, including that person. And that's what we're going to do as we move forward with connected particles. So the way that two particles could be connected could either be a trailer and a car connected together and pulling in the same direction, or it could be two things on a pulley, in which case they're going to be going in different directions. The key thing to think about is that we can only treat them as a whole particle, so treat it as a total thing, if they're accelerating in the same direction. If the two things are moving in different directions, then you can't look at it as one individual particle. So just pause the video now and have a think about that in the diagrams below, could you treat them as separate or could you treat them as a whole system or could you do both? Okay, so pretty much in summary, anything can be treated as separate particles. So that's definitely something which we can do for every one of these situations. And we can only deal with the whole system when they are going in the same direction. So hopefully a trailer and a car would always be going in the same direction, otherwise we've got issues. However, in a pulley system, they can be going in different directions. So for example, in number one here, one's going up and one's going down. So we can't treat them as a total mass there and neither can we do it if they're on a slant. There are two key words that will come up when we're looking at connected particles. One is light. So if the string connecting the particles is light, then we can assume that it has no mass, so we don't have to use that in our calculations. And secondly, this word inextensible. Now, if the string connecting these particles is inextensible, it means that we can consider tension being the same throughout the whole string, so we don't have to worry about it changing. And also, as the string is not extending, the acceleration of both particles on either end of the string is got to be the same. OK, so here's an example question. We've got two particles, P and Q, of masses 5 kilograms and 3 kilogram respectively. Now this word means that it's in the same order, so P is 5 and Q is 3. And they're connected by our light and inextensible string, so there we are, we've got our two keywords coming up straight away. Particle P is pulled along by a horizontal force of magnitude 40 newtons. Okay, So that's come up here on my diagram and it's on a rough horizontal plane, so immediately I know that I've got friction both on P, which is going through the ground, and on Q. We're also told that the coefficient of friction between the blocks is 0 0.2, so that would be a useful little addition just to write up here to help us out. OK, and we've been tasked with finding the acceleration of each particle and the tension in the string. So I've started off by drawing a diagram on the left which looks at particle P pulling along particle Q with this string here. Okay. Now at both ends of the string we've got tension. So the tension in this half of the string is pulling back on P. If you think about when you're pulling somebody else along it feels as though you're being pulled backwards. There's also the feeling of tension for Q it's being pulled along, so it's feeling like tension is going forwards, hence the direction of my arrows here. So that's the entire connected diagram. Now on the right hand side I've drawn it all in blue, and I've put a box around all of the forces which are acting on particle P. And on the left I've done a similar thing, putting a red box around all the forces which are acting on Q. So similarly to the lift, we can resolve once for P and once for Q. We've also got another way of doing it, again similar to lift, when we're considering the whole lift itself. This time we can consider the whole thing as one. So rather than considering it separate particles P and Q, we can look at the fact that we've got the whole weight or mass of 8 kilograms. We've still got this one force pulling it forward. We'll have a combined normal force, a combined weight, and combined friction. So I can do equations for any of these red, blue, or green areas, depending on what I want. OK, so looking at question A, we've got to find the acceleration of each, and we know that our acceleration is going to be going to the right, because of all the forces that we've got involved. So what you need to think about, first of all, is if I resolve the red or the blue sections, how many unknowns would I have? So just looking at this blue section here, I wouldn't know friction 
but I could calculate it by finding the normal. I wouldn't know tension and I wouldn't know the acceleration. So with just that equation there, we might struggle to find acceleration. So what might be easier is to first of all look at the green box there and come up with an equation just for our green section. So if we do that and we resolve to the right, we're going to have 40 minus 0.2n, so that's my friction component, and that's going to be equal to 8a. Now obviously we're also going to need to think about finding out the value of n, so it might be helpful to resolve upwards. So we've got n minus 8g being equal to 0, so this is a nice easy calculation for n. That's 8 times 9.8 giving us 78.4 newtons. So I can immediately take that value and sub it into equation 1. So that's going to give me an acceleration of 3.04 metres per second squared. And you should just check that calculation rearranging it for yourself. OK, so that's part A answered. Now we're looking at part B, we're trying to find the tension in the string. Now on our green diagram that we've just used, there is no tension, so we're definitely not going to want to use that. However, we could use the blue diagram, or we could indeed use the red. I'm going to choose to use the blue. OK, so again, I'm going to resolve horizontally and I'm going to resolve vertically. I might just start off by resolving vertically this time so I can find out n straight away. So again, a nice easy calculation there. We know that there's no acceleration going vertically, so we can say that the normal is just going to be 49 newtons. Now I can resolve horizontally. Now I've got a choice here, either to go right in the direction of acceleration or left in the direction of tension. And I'm going to stick to convention and resolve to the right, which is my direction of acceleration. So I've got 40 minus tension minus... 0.2 times 49, so that is my frictional component there, knowing that mu is 0.2. And that's going to be equal to our mass of 5 times by the acceleration, which we've just worked out, which is 3.04. Now I can do a little bit of rearranging. So if I keep t on the left, it's going to be a negative t, so it might be easier to move it to the right. So I'll then get 40 minus 0 0.2 times 49. Nothing's changed so far. I'll move my MA component from the right, so 5 times 3.04. And I'm adding T to both sides, so it's going to become a positive T over there. Finally, after all of that rearranging is complete, T comes out to be a lovely nice value of 15 newtons. OK. Onto our second example, this time we're dealing with pulleys rather than two things being pulled along a straight surface. And so immediately we're thinking, OK, it's pulleys, we can't consider it all in one go because while well, one ball's going up, the other one's going down, so they're never going in the same direction. OK, reading into the question then. Particles of masses 2 kilograms and 3 kilograms are attached to the end of a light, so we don't need to consider the mass, inextensible, so we can consider tension to be the same everywhere, and it's our string. The string passes over a small, smooth fixed pulley, so we know that there's no friction across the pulley, and the masses hang with the string taut, so i.e. they're straight. OK, so we've got to find the acceleration of Q. Now, as I've used the numerical masses rather than P and Q on my diagram, it might be helpful for me just to annotate that and say, OK, I know that Q is my 3 kilogram particle. So that's what I'm thinking about in part A. OK, so I've started drawing the diagram here. Obviously, we're going to have tension pulling up on both of them from the string. And the downwards component is going to be our weight, so 3g and 2g. Again, I've separated them out into a red bit and a blue bit. I haven't got acceleration on the diagram yet. So what we want to think about is which one's heavier, which one's going to fall down. Obviously, the 3 kilograms, so our acceleration here is going to go downwards. Right, so as we're looking at the 3 kilogram particle, I'm going to do a blue resolving. 
and I'm going to resolve in my direction of acceleration down. Okay, so 3g minus t equals our mass of 3 times by the acceleration. So we think that we could just divide by 3 and find the answer. Unfortunately, life is not so good for us. We've got t, which we don't know, and a, which we don't know. So as soon as we've got two unknowns, we're expecting we'd have to write two equations. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a look at my particle a, for which our acceleration is going upwards, while m is the blue one is going downwards. So I'm going to do myself a red equation now. And I'm going to resolve upwards, because that's the way the particle is looking to go. Okay, so I've got t minus 2g is equal to our mass of 2 times by the acceleration. So I've now got two equations which I can solve to find my acceleration. Up to you how you want to do this. Either you can rearrange and make t the subject of 1 and sub in. But just looking immediately here, I've got t as a positive on this equation and t as a negative in that equation and the same amount of both. So the easiest way to do it is just do a large addition. So then we'd have 3g minus 2g would give us just g, t minus 2t gives us nothing, and 3a plus 2a gives us 5a. So we can see from this that our acceleration is a fifth of the amount of gravity, so it's going to be 9.8 divided by 5, giving us 1.96 meters per second squared. Okay, so that's part A answered. Part B, the particles are released from rest at equal height 50 centimeters above the ground. Calculate the time taken for Q to impact the ground. Okay, so as soon as we're looking at time taken, we immediately want to be thinking about SUVAT. So we'll start looking at our information. S U V A N T. Okay, particles are released from rest, so we know that our initial velocity is zero. If I'm going to take downwards as my positive direction, which will probably make sense as the particle is moving downwards, then my displacement is going to be 50 centimetres down. Remembering that we use metres, it's going to be 0 0.5 as the value I use, because it's in centimetres. Okay. We don't care about the final velocity, we know that the acceleration is 1.96 and time is what we are trying to find out. So we'll use s equals ut plus a half at squared. Subbing in our values 0.5 equals nothing times time, so nothing, a half times 1.96 times t squared. So a little bit of rearranging here, 0 0.5 over a half times 1.96 equals t squared. Obviously you could do this far more elegantly if you wanted to, and way back here you could have cancelled that half with that half. And then we've just got to find the square roots of those values of t, which gives us that t is equal to 5 over 7 seconds, which is also equal to 0 0.714 seconds if you want to use a decimal there.